Daytona, 1986. The number 34 Suzuki belongs to Houston, Texas native Kevin Schwantz. This was the coming out party for the Yoshimura Suzuki rider. The former club rider was thrusted into the job of Yoshimura Suzuki team leader against the likes of Eddie Lawson, Wayne Rainey, and Fred Merkel. How did he do? Just fine, thank you. Riding like a veteran, the lanky Texan with curly blonde hair served notice that he would be a force to reckon with in the very near future. On this day in Daytona Beach, Schwantz finished a solid second to world champion Lawson and the factory Yamaha. He shared the winner's circle with Lawson and three-time U.S. Superbike champion Merkel. The early chapters of the Schwantz story were being written. The remainder of the 1986 season was a learning process for Schwantz and the Yoshimura Suzuki team. The previous year, Schwantz had had some outings with the team on a relatively sedate motorcycle without much success. 86 was his first real season and the first season for the Suzuki GSXR 750 motorcycle, which would later become a potent force in the hands of the Texan. Throughout the 86 season, Schwantz and the GSXR proved fast but unreliable. He played second fiddle to the Honda Twins, Wayne Rainey number six and Fred Merkel number one. The Honda riders rode the Honda Interceptor, which had thousands of miles of development. Rainey and Merkel were former superbike champions and had a wealth of knowledge when it came to setting up, then riding, the powerful four-stroke machines. Still, Schwantz was fast enough to stay with the Honda riders and learn what they were doing on the track. As the season progressed, Schwantz learned quickly and became faster than his Honda rivals. Add to that a season of development on the Suzuki GSXR motorcycle, and by season's end, Schwantz and the Suzuki were favorites to take the pole position and lead in the very early going. Victory, though, eluded Schwantz and company in 1986. In December of 86, Schwantz and the Yoshimura Suzuki team headed for Daytona for tire testing. Suzuki had seen enough of Schwantz to know that he was exactly what they were looking for, fast, aggressive, and with the desire to go all the way. He was like a minor league pitcher with a 110 mile an hour fastball. He was still raw, but everyone could see unlimited potential. The same could be said for the Suzuki motorcycle. The GSXR was like no machine before it. Out of the crate, it was a true race bike, without a doubt the best package available to consumers to date. If both Schwantz and the GSXR were to realize their potential in 87, well, there would be a lot of silverware in the trophy cases in Japan and in Texas. As Schwantz and Japanese teammate Satoshi Sujimoto circulated the Daytona track, Schwantz was already thinking about next season. 1986 was very definitely a learning exercise. Contesting the entire season as a full-fledged factory rider in the U.S. and sampling the European GP arena with a three-race deal, Schwantz was thrown out head first into pavement racing's highest learning institutions. The main thing I learned was to, to go out and, and do good in a, in a championship series. You have to go out and finish consistent in all the races. It doesn't mean just winning one important race here or one important race there. It means that you have to go out and you have to put together nine complete races and finish the best that you can in all, in all nine races and hopefully win as many of them as you can to be able to do any good in a, in a championship series. You know, if it were just one race, you, can, you could make or break it in one race. But with there being nine races here in America for the superbikes, you have to go out and finish consistent. You can't go out and get hurt. I, um, I fell down the third race of the year and broke my collarbone and missed the, uh, the next three races. So um, it was kind of a disappointing year for me and, I, and for Suzuki also. And hopefully next year will be a lot better. ESPN's The Best of American Motorcycle Racing is being brought to you. Welcome back to The Best of American Motorcycle Racing and our look at road racing star Kevin Schwantz. I'm Bruce Flanders and we're in Daytona Beach, Florida for round one of the 1987 Superbike Championship, the famed Daytona 200. Schwantz and Japanese Formula One champ Satoshi Tsujimoto arrived at the Florida track as pre-race favorites. Their December tire testing was very positive, and with the disappointment of the 86 season behind them, 1987 promised to be a successful one. During the week, it became obvious that Schwantz and Team Honda's Wayne Rainey were going to lock horns. 
And if they were to somehow falter, their backups, Honda's Bubba Schobert and Suzuki's Sujimoto, would be there to ensure victory. The pressure of the big race was evident in the faces and in the atmosphere surrounding the speedway. As far as Schwantz was concerned, his philosophy leading up to race day had been established in the early days of his career. I think the main thing is, is to be able to go to the track on Thursday and um, start practicing. The, my, my main goal is to go there and to be as fast in practice as, as the other fast riders are, to not be a second or two behind the pace. That's, that's the main way. I like, if come race day, I'm within a tenth or two tenths of a second of the, of the guys who are going the fastest, I'll f I feel confident that, I can, that I'll be there in the race because I normally pick up anywhere from three quarters of a second to a whole second in a race over just practicing and sometimes even more than that. So the main thing I try not to do is psych myself out. If I, don't, I don't think about the race the night before. I try and go home, get a good night's rest, eat a good meal, and just, um, just, just basically get a good night's rest and be good and prepared for the race on Sunday. As the 200-miler unfolded, the anticipated Schwantz rainy battle materialized to the delight of the fans on hand. But unlike the previous year, Rainey and the Honda were no longer the superior combination. Lap after lap in methodical fashion, Schwantz and the number 34 Suzuki began to inch further and further from Rainey and the Honda. It was a foregone conclusion at the three-quarter mark in the race that all Schwantz had to do was stay up on two wheels, and the prestigious victory would belong to the Texan, the Yoshimura crew, and the Suzuki GSXR. Unfortunately, fate intervened in a cruel way. Late in the race, a backmarker fouled up Schwantz's entrance to the Daytona chicane, causing the Texan to go down and out of the Daytona 200. Here it is again in slow motion. You can't see the back marker, but his presence was enough to send Schwantz and his Suzuki into a wild slide. Schwantz was uninjured, except for a badly lacerated finger. Honda's Wayne Rainey raised his hand high in Daytona's victory circle at the end of the day. Schwantz's failure was his success. It was a hard lesson learned. Kevin Schwantz and Wayne Rainey met again on the track several weeks after Daytona, this time on foreign soil. The occasion? the 17th annual Transatlantic Match Races, a team event pitting North American riders against their British Commonwealth counterparts. In 1987, the series format called for nine sprint races on two of England's premier road racing circuits. Forget about the team competition, though. Schwantz and Rainey electrified the British fans with fairing banging action in each of the nine encounters. Schwantz had something to prove. He'd earned a reputation of being somewhat reckless. Daytona didn't help that image. Riding on the edge, Schwantz didn't fall in England. Battling with Rainey, he helped lead the American contingent over the Brits in the final team standings. Just staying upright was not an easy task for some of the other Americans. Number 53, Dan Chivington, went down several times during the two-day affair. The second time with the help of a British compatriot. I'm sure that gesture was nothing compared to what he was screaming underneath his helmet. Canadian Gary Goodfellow also sampled the British tarmac as he took this wild ride. The British fans on hand were not too sympathetic, though, since Goodfellow rode for the North American squad. In the end, Rainey won five of the races, Schwantz four. Let's look at some of the Schwantz Rainey action in slow motion. In this sequence at the Brands Hatch circuit, the right knee of Schwantz actually serves as a battering ram as it smashes into Rainey's motorcycle. In this sequence, Schwantz tries the inside, but Rainey slams the door. More contact, neither rider goes down or is phased. And watch this recovery by Schwantz as he hangs off too much and snags his knee. That gives new meaning to the term riding all out. Back stateside, it was time to resume the 1987 U.S. Superbike Championship. Road Atlanta was the site for round two. And like Daytona and the match races, it was number six Wayne Rainey on the Honda and Schwantz up front. Rainey's teammate Bubba Schobert, number 67, circulated in third, biding his time. If either of the speedsters up front faltered in the least, he would have been more than glad to take over. Schobert was riding a smart race, especially when you consider the antics at the front of the pack. Case in point, watch this as Rainey passes Schwantz. The Suzuki rider gestures to Rainey. Your guess is as good as mine as to what was meant by all that. As the two hammered at each other in the 24-lap race, neither rider could gain any significant advantage over the other. The fans were treated to the two best superbike riders of the day, putting on a hell of a show. As in Daytona, the race would be decided by fate. 
Out of camera view, Schwantz made an impromptu off-road excursion. Rainey went on to take the win and a substantial lead in the standings. In two races, Schwantz had been in position to win, only to have victory snatched from under him late in the going. Laguna Seca Raceway in Monterey, California. At this point in the 87 season, Rainey had built up an insurmountable lead in the standings over Schwantz. But the Texan and the Yoshimura team were still in the hunt wherever they went. The scenario was the same at all the racetracks. Schwantz would prove to be the quickest rider on the track, but mental errors robbed the Suzuki rider of victory. At the prestigious Laguna Seca event, Schwantz again held the lead and was on his way to a sure win when fate yet again reared its ugly head. This time, it was Bubba Schobert who was the benefactor as he took a popular win in front of his adopted home track fans. The transplanted Texan had recently moved to nearby Carmel Valley. Rainey, meanwhile, padded his points lead. At the season finale in Northern California, Schwantz and the Suzuki were unstoppable. Starting from the last row due to a heat race infraction, Schwantz carved his way through the field in a handful of laps. At the Snake Lake Sears Point Raceway, that was a superhuman feat. The Texan had created a new mindset after the Laguna Seca disappointment. It was clear that Kevin Schwantz and the Suzuki GSXR motorcycle were the fastest combination on the U.S. Superbike scene. Schwantz could not make up the deficit in the point standings incurred by his two early season DNFs. But when the final checkered flag fell at Sears Point, fans, competitors, and the media all had to acknowledge that Schwantz and the Suzuki were the currently best combination out there. Unfortunately for Schwantz and Yoshimura, 1988 would see the Texan in Europe full time, except for one race, Daytona. Welcome back to the best of American motorcycle racing. I'm Bruce Flanders, and we're in the garage area at Daytona International Speedway, the year 1988. Kevin Schwantz was preparing for his first full season of Grand Prix racing, but had a point to make prior to his overseas departure. As you remember, Daytona 1987 had been a bitter disappointment for both Schwantz and Suzuki. On the way to victory, Schwantz crashed. With the memory of that day serving as a tremendous motivation factor, Schwantz went about the business of preparing for his only U.S. Superbike appearance of 88. Schwantz was hampered in practice and qualifying by a broken wrist, which swelled up and hindered his technique. Still, when it came down to qualifying, Schwantz put his Suzuki GSXR on the pole. Qualifying at Daytona is special to Schwantz. It was during qualifications for this big race in 1985 that the Texan realized he had a special gift. Well, I guess the first big test was the first national here in 1985 at Daytona when I came here on a, a GS 700 and wasn't even expected to qualify in the top 10 and uh, managed to qualify third uh, right in the middle of the front row. That was, that was I think, the first time I realized that, that I was going to be able to do good as a road racer and that the stuff I had done before wasn't just all luck. By the time the green flag fell at the 1988 Daytona 200, most observers felt that it was a foregone conclusion that the number 34 Suzuki would end up in the winner's circle. However, the memories of the 87 Daytona event and Laguna Seca were still lurking in the back of everyone's mind. Those worries and the bad memories, however, were to be erased forever. Daytona 1988 turned out to be a grand day for Schwantz and Suzuki. No disappointments, no excuses, no problems. Schwantz devastated the competition. Suzuki put an exclamation point on the race, with Schwantz's Yoshimura teammate, Doug Poland, coming in a solid second place. The day and the moment, though, belonged to Schwantz. The then 23-year-old had redeemed himself and had given Suzuki their first ever victory in the prestigious Daytona 200. Determination, the key to Daytona 88, as far as Schwantz is concerned, his best asset. I guess the other thing is just determination. I've I've always uh, enjoyed riding motorcycles. I've, I've always wanted to be the best at, at one certain thing. And um, I think that in a couple of years, I should be able to be, become world champion if uh, I don't have any big problems. Those prophetic words would soon be put to the test. While Schwantz and company celebrated their Daytona victory, the Texan was already preparing himself mentally for round one of the 1988 World Championship, the all-important Japanese Grand Prix. 
Let's be honest. Motorcycles are sexy. So are the men who ride them. With a few exceptions. You're the guys who dress for the beach instead of the ride. That's dumb. Of course, there's more to it than what you wear, like showing some common sense and courtesy when you ride. That's smart. And I find that very attractive. This veritable sea of motorcycles belong to Japanese road race fans attending round one of the world championship, the Japanese Grand Prix. For Schwantz, Suzuki, and new sponsor Pepsi-Cola, the 88 season outlook was positive. The new Suzuki motorcycle was now on a par with the other Japanese racing hardware. At the start of the first GP of the year, Schwantz shot into the lead, followed by the world's best riders on the most technologically advanced two-wheeled machinery in existence. Schwantz had tested the new Suzuki at the Suzuka circuit several weeks prior to the race. What he found out in those test sessions came as good news to the Suzuki camp. Bad news for the opposition. The Texan had shattered the lap record while testing, and when it came down to race day, everyone was shooting for the Texan and his number 34, Pepsi Suzuki. The only rider to hang on to Schwantz was the defending world champion, Wayne Gardner, on the number one Honda. The Australian actually got by the American rider and led for a while until this breathtaking pass. In slow motion, you can see Schwantz on the throttle all the way through the turn, never letting up committing himself to the pass and executing it perfectly. Gardner had to be not only surprised, but impressed as well. Schwantz and the other current top American riders have elevated the GP riding technique a couple of notches, as Kenny Roberts demonstrated so decisively in his career. Schwantz and company have come to realize that sliding the motorcycle, as learned through American dirt tracking, is often the fast way around. I think um, as fast as, as they go, in Europe and in the World Championship stuff, you have to you have to be able to go out and ride 35 laps or however many laps the race consists of. You have to be able to go out and ride 35 laps, sliding the front tire, pushing I mean pushing the front tire, sliding the rear wheel the whole time. And um, I think that's that's where the dirt track comes in. Um, Eddie Lawson and Kenny Roberts, everybody, Wayne Rainey, they've all ridden dirt track, and uh, I think it's really helped a lot. In the end, Schwantz his sliding technique, and his Pepsi Suzuki crossed the Japanese GP finish line first. It was the Texans' first world championship victory in his first GP as a full-fledged factory rider. As you can tell by his exuberance on the cool-off lap, Schwantz was happy to say the least. As far as the Suzuki factory was concerned, he could have packed up and gone home. With the wins at Daytona and in the Japanese Grand Prix, Schwantz and Suzuki had scored the most important wins on the world racing schedule. Anything else would just be icing on the cake the famed Nürburgring in Germany. Along with Monza in Italy, and perhaps Brands Hatch in England, the Nürburgring is one of the most historically significant circuits in the world. Steeped in racing tradition, this track has been the site of many important moments in two- and four-wheel racing. The 1988 German Grand Prix would provide another memorable chapter in Nürburgring history. As the race unfolded under inclement skies, Schwanz and his Suzuki were on the move. The Texan was soon in the lead, riding away from the competition in the treacherous conditions. Schwantz has learned the circuits of Europe well. For an American coming over to contest the world championship, learning a specific track while setting up a bike is vital. Schwantz has developed his own method of acclimating himself and his machine to a new facility. I try and go out and, and try and learn all the, I guess, the really tough spots in the track. There's, you know, there's, there's two or three corners in most tracks that they take quite a while to learn over just the other simple, basic right and left turn corners. Um, the main thing is just go out and, and practice the first couple sessions and, and just try and make your lines smooth around the track. And then the next two sessions, try and pick up the pace and try and get a good qualifying time in. In front of the appreciative German crowd, front wheel up in the air, Schwantz powered to victory. The Schwantz-Suzuki combination were now threats to pull off the victory wherever they raced. For Team Pepsi Suzuki, 1988 was a surprisingly successful venture when you consider the fact that it was the first full year for their rider and for their Grand Prix motorcycle. It was a fantastic year. 1989 would be a tougher assignment. No longer would they be considered an outside, unproven entity. The opposition viewed them as a legitimate world title challenger. No longer could they count on the element of surprise. Everyone would begin 1989 with a clean slate. 
Honda, Yamaha, and Suzuki would be viewed as equals in the 1989 world title chase. The Suzuka Circuit in Japan. Round one of the 1989 World Championship. The 22-lap race on the intimidating 3.64-mile Suzuka circuit would go down as one of the most spectacular in recent history. Forget what specific teams or specific riders wanted to prove in the season opener. Everything and everybody had to take a back seat to a couple of riders at the top of their game. The 1989 Japanese Grand Prix will be remembered as the race in which Kevin Schwantz and the Suzuki battled Wayne Rainey and the Lucky Strike Yamaha. The perennial rivals electrified the close to 85,000 Japanese fans by racing fairing to fairing the entire race distance. Schwantz reflects on his strategy when it comes to close quarters racing. As far as if I'm out there in a race and me and another guy are going head to head, I don't I don't really use brake markers as much as most people do. I, um, however far he goes into a corner, I'd like to go in just a little further. And uh, that's, that's the way I ride most races is wherever somebody gets on their brakes, I try and go in just as far, if not further, than they do and try and get on the gas earlier or if, it, if not earlier at the same time as they do just to either try and stay with them or get in front of them. And as long as you can keep a wheel in beside somebody, they're, they're always worried about you being there and there's a lot bigger chance of them making a mistake than you. The action was so spectacular that words cannot do it justice. So sit back and enjoy two of the best Grand Prix riders going at it while listening to the beautiful sound of 500cc two-stroke V4s at full song. <laughs> Kevin Schwantz went on from his second straight Japanese Grand Prix win to garner four more Grand Prix victories in 1989, with one more race still to be run. Although Schwantz won't be the 1989 world champion, he will have won more races than any other rider, no matter what happens in the season finale in Brazil. Place your bets. 1990 should be the year for Schwantz and Team Pepsi Suzuki. The last two seasons can be looked at as the making of a world champion. For the best of American motorcycle racing, I'm Bruce Flanders. Of the 1988 125cc motocross championship series, George Holland's dream of a national title drew closer to reality. After each event, the series leader returned home to Kerman, California, to wonder if this was the year. Uh, it was really important for me. Um, I wasn't really worried about anything but the championship all year long. I mean, I didn't care about the money, anything. All I wanted was the championship, so I set my goals to win it, and everything I did was focused around the championship. George was not the only member of the Holland household focused on the title. Sharing each experience, good and bad, Dana Holland became a familiar figure in the Honda pits. Um, I think I'd rather be there. At least I know what's going on. Um, I've stayed home before and it's kind of hard because you're wondering what's going on and worrying. So I like it better there. There, for round nine, was the Steel City track in Delmont, Pennsylvania. For Eric Kehoe, who was second in the standings, 37 points behind Holland, time was running out. Still, the Suzuki star had not given up. The last two races I've had some bad luck. I had a flat tire the first moto while, while I was leading at Binghamton last week. And the week before that, I had a rear wheel break and I had to stop in the pit area and uh, change the rear wheel during the race. So I lost some points there, um, but uh, we've got you know, a few more races left, so I'm going to do the best I can to catch up. When the gate dropped for the start of moto number one, the rest of the field played catch up to Kehoe. The Suzuki rider found a good line on the inside of the first corner and emerged with the lead. In the second corner, however, the Suzuki bogged momentarily, and both Holland and Cooper were quick to take advantage of the situation. Kehoe quickly recovered and held on to third. 
For several laps, the order remained unchanged. Then Cooper, not happy with second, astounded the crowd. He jumped over the top of Holland and took the lead. The Honda rider from Oklahoma, though, was not able to hold it. Nor could Holland hold second. Toward the end of the moto, Eric Kehoe emerged as the leader and went on to claim the win. In the second moto, Holland again was the early leader. This time he was way out in front with local favorite Mike Jones in second and Cooper third. It was time for another aerial show and Cooper obliged. Mike Jones didn't believe it and looked around to see what happened and that was all Kehoe needed and the Suzuki rider moved up to third. By the end of the moto, Kehoe was in second and closing on Holland, but time ran out. Kehoe with a first and a second took the overall win but hardly dented the points lead of Holland who recorded a third and a first. With only three championship rounds remaining, including this one at Troy, Ohio, Holland appeared to have the championship in the bag. It would take extraordinarily bad luck on his part to lose it now. With the first moto underway, Holland's luck was all good. He got the whole shot, missing this monumental traffic jam. Two laps later, Guy Cooper was the leader and was pulling away. Holland wisely let Cooper go. The Troy track, slippery from an all-night rain, was no place for heroics. Cooper took the win with Holland second. Eric Kehoe had survived an early moto crash to finish sixth. That, though, turned out to be the least of Kehoe's worries. Moto number two was a complete disaster for the Suzuki star. In the early going, Holland, riding at a smooth, confident pace, was the leader, followed by Donnie Schmidt, number 16, and Ty Davis, number 191. Kehoe was in fourth place, well within striking distance of his longtime foe. Then Kehoe failed to come around. It was later learned that while trying to pass Davis, Kehoe had sideswiped a fence pole and left the race with back and foot injuries. For Kehoe, the season was over. The slippery Troy, Ohio track took its toll, while the series points leader took the checkered flag and his third overall win of the season. More importantly, with two races remaining and Kehoe out on the sidelines, Holland left Troy, Ohio with a nearly insurmountable championship points lead. When we return, the final rounds of the championship drive. Welcome back. I'm Bruce Flanders, and you're watching the best of American motorcycle racing. With two rounds remaining, the 1988 AMA 125cc National Championship Motocross Series was all but wrapped up. At Millville, Minnesota, series leader George Holland needed only 20 points to ensure the title. A third place finish in moto number one would do the trick. Uh, I'm just going to try to go out there and do what I've been doing all year. I kind of, if I start thinking about the points lead and think about riding a little bit slower and being cautious, I think it might, I might make mistakes. So I'm just going to try to go out there and kind of play it by ear. And uh, if I get out in the lead, I'm going to try to win. Behind Holland, the standings were in a turmoil. Second place, Eric Kehoe was out with injuries. And Guy Cooper in third needed only 14 points to move up. Just five points behind Cooper was heavy crowd favorite Donnie Schmidt from nearby Bloomington, Minnesota. With the first moto underway, George Holland was in third, the position he needed to wrap up the crowd. The crowd, though, paid the Honda rider scant attention. Their eyes were directed to Donnie Schmidt in first and Guy Cooper in second. For 30 minutes, the trio of riders pounded the rough Minnesota track with no change in position. When the checkered flag came out, Cooper had moved to second in the championship standings, and Schmidt, the local, was only three points behind in third. Lost in the turmoil was George Holland's third place finish that wrapped up the 1988 crown. It's a lot of hard work. I've put in a lot of years trying to win this, and uh, I finally won it. I think I've been racing 16 years. It's kind of been a goal, and I finally won it, so I'm pretty relieved. For Holland, the second moto was run on pure adrenaline. The year-long struggle was at last over, and amidst the Schmidt-Cooper battle, winning the title seemed almost anticlimactic. Holland finished sixth in moto number two after taking the early lead, then crashing. Also crashing in the second moto, in fact, he did it twice, was crowd favorite Donnie Schmidt. The Suzuki rider, though, was not about to be denied. Schmidt rebounded, and late in the moto, passed Yamaha's Mike LaRocco for the win and enough points to take over second in the standings. Cooper, with a flat tire, finished the second moto in fifth. The Pacific Northwest played host to the 12th and final round of the 1988 125cc National Championship. For George Holland, the pressure was off. At Washougal, Holland would ride for his own self-esteem. 
The battle for second place, however, would go to the wire. Seven points separated Cooper in third and Donnie Schmidt in second. The first moto was underway and George Holland was in front, followed by Rick Simmons. Those that thought Holland would rest on his laurels had another think coming. The newly crowned champ was going for the win. And so too was Cooper. The Oklahoma rider made the pass and moved into second. Behind the front runners, the rest of the pack, including Donnie Schmidt, fought for position. When the front runners came back around, Holland had dropped off the pace, and Guy Cooper was in the lead, followed by Jeff Emig on a Kawasaki. Cooper's position up front was never challenged. Emig, however, by the midway point, had all kinds of company. It was the first ever pro race for Emig, and the pace was too much for too long. By the end of the moto, Holland had moved into the second position, Mike LaRocco was third, and Donnie Schmidt survived a crash and finished fourth. After a full season of racing, Cooper and Schmidt were tied in points with a single moto remaining. The gate dropped and the final race of the year was underway. As he'd done so many times during the long season, George Holland jumped into the lead, followed by Todd DeHoop, Donnie Schmidt, Mike LaRocco, and Guy Cooper. Behind them, a pileup in the first corner, but no harm done. Up front, when the pack came back around, Cooper and LaRocco were missing. It was later learned LaRocco went down and Cooper plowed into it. By the time he recovered and resumed racing, the season was as good as over. Cooper finished third in the moto, but Schmidt finished second. Good enough to give the Team Suzuki rider second overall for the season. The moto win and the day's overall crown went to George Holland. It was his fourth overall win of the year. For George Holland and the rest of the competitors in the 125cc national championship class, the long season was finally over. For some like Eric Kehoe who suffered flats, broken wheels and continual bad luck, it was a season of heartbreak and disappointment. For others like Guy Cooper who finished third despite missing the first two rounds due to injury, it was a season of what if. For George Holland though, it was a season of hard work, dedication, sacrifice and putting it all together. That's what championships are all about. For the best of American motorcycle racing, I'm Bruce Flanders. of American Motorcycle Racing on ESPN. Hello, I'm Bruce Flanders, and for the next 13 weeks, I'll be your host for this unique and comprehensive series on motorcycle sport. In upcoming editions on the Best of American Motorcycle Racing, you'll see everything from Grand Prix road racing to outdoor motocross to hill climbing. For our opening show, however, the subject is production-based road racing. This is the Suzuki GSXR. This is a Suzuki Katana. You can buy them at your local dealer for a ride around the block, or you can buy them to race around the track. Whichever your choice, you're going to be riding the ultimate sports performance machine. Now take that same motorcycle, hand it over to the best racers in America, and put up thousands in prize money. What you get is the closest, most exciting road racing in the U.S. Today, on the best of American motorcycle racing, it's the third annual Suzuki National Cup Series Finals from Road Atlanta in Brasselton, Georgia. In the four-wheel arena, the International Race of Champions Series, or IROC, pits the best drivers against each other in identically prepared machinery. In two-wheel warfare, the Suzuki Cup Series utilizes the same principle, but instead of Chevrolet Camaros, the racers compete on exotic Suzuki sport motorcycles available at your local dealer. Using the automobile arena again as a point of reference, these Suzuki motorcycles in basically stock trim are the Ferraris and Porsches of the motorcycle industry. Well, the Suzuki GSXR 
has features in it that are are bred right off of the superbike racing that we've done. Okay, in the past, uh, this bike is is got the same brakes. It's got the same suspension setup. The geometry and everything is the same as the Formula One racing bike that I ride in Japan for you know for factory Yoshimura. So with a combination of all those parts and everything involved in it, um, you get a motorcycle that uh, can be competitive at any racetrack with anybody at any time right out of the crate. In other words, production based right off the showroom floor. The Suzuki National Cup Finals are staged in three classes differentiated by engine displacement, 600, 750, and 1100 cc's. Despite the variety in engine size, every rider competing on this day had two challenges, his fellow competitors and the 2.52 mile Road Atlanta course. Road Atlanta has been termed both a rider's track as well as a performance track. Every turn, with the exceptions of turns six and seven, are considered medium fast to very fast. Add to that severe elevation changes, and you have a track worthy of any rider or machine. With the help of 750cc standout Scott Gray and his Yoshimura engineering prepared Suzuki, we had an opportunity to see and experience the track close up with an unusual perspective. We mounted a miniature camera onto one of the Suzuki's front fork legs in order to get an idea of what it's like at speed on the Road Atlanta track. This is the start-finish front straightaway, which is the second fastest portion of the track. After you go through the gears, you have to prepare for turn one. Starting from the outside of the track, you swing over to the apex of the turn, which is an ascending right-hander. Turn two and three come next. A quick bank to the right and a flick to the left. You're heading downhill after you exit turn three. Turns four and five make up the famous Road Atlanta S's. At the end of the S's, which is turn five, you start uphill again. Road Atlanta is a very fast track with constant elevation changes, similar in character to West Coast tracks like Sears Point and Laguna Seca. This short straight leads to the slowest portions of the track, turns six and seven. Both turns are 90 degree right-handers that are connected by a short chute. It's really important to keep your momentum up here because the back straightaway comes up right after you exit turn seven. Lost RPMs here translate into lost miles per hour at the end of the straight. The back straight at Road Atlanta is one of the longest and fastest in the U.S. On a 750cc motorcycle like the one Scott Gray is riding, speeds approach 150 miles an hour. When you peel off in there, it's just, it's really a rush. You know, you're going 145, 150 miles an hour, uh, leaned over and accelerating down the hill, and then you go shoot up the hill, and you get an incredible rush. The Nissan Bridge, or Turn 11, is very tricky because you exit onto the slippery painted surface, which highlights the entrance to the pits. Turn 12 is a very fast right-hander, brings you back onto the straight and the completion of a lap at Road Atlanta. When we return, we'll drop the green flag on the 600 and 1100 CC class finals. In addition to Suzuki prize money, lucrative contingencies from Dunlop, Kushitani Leathers, EBC Brakes, and CalGuard Lubricants will be up for grabs. ESPN's The Best of American Motorcycle Racing returns to Road Atlanta right after this. This edition of The Best of American Motorcycle Racing is brought to you in part by Suzuki. No matter what your riding style, Suzuki has got the ride you've been waiting for. Get ready for a special Sports Illustrated sneak preview. It's unreal. The man, it's like he's from another planet. You never know what he's going to do. He doesn't even know. He just does it, and you're like, duh. They just saw an amazing video cassette presented by Sports Illustrated, starring the most exciting figure in sports today. Who else? Jordan. Unbelievable. Yeah, he's unbelievable. Michael Jordan, come fly with me 1990. Over 40 minutes of the game's ultimate playmaker. Yours free with your paid subscription to SI. Yes! Call toll-free and get 26 issues of SI at over 45% off the cover price. I didn't realize you could save that much. Including SI's blockbuster baseball preview, the giant 35th anniversary covers issue, and the red hot swimsuit issue. So what's the catch? No catch. You get it all for just three monthly installments of $12.97 each. Even use your credit card. Golden. Let's do it. Save over 45% and get the Jordan video free. You're going to be giving away a lot of these babies starting right here.
ESPN is your ringside seat for a middleweight faceoff. Knockout artist Glenn Wolf battles Matthew Hilton when Budweiser presents Top Rank Boxing Tuesday night at 8 Eastern, live on ESPN. The best relief from this hectic season is a jingle away. Ring in the holiday in 30 minutes or less. Domino's Pizza. Nobody delivers better. This ESPN program is brought to you by Domino's Pizza Incorporated. Hot, fresh, delicious pizza. Domino's Pizza. Nobody delivers better. Welcome back to the Suzuki National Cup Finals from Road Atlanta. I'm Bruce Flanders, and you're watching the 600cc Katana class on the grid, waiting the start of their 12-lap battle. The motorcycles in this race are all Suzuki Katanas, with engine displacement of 600ccs. The double overhead cam, 16-valve four-cylinder, air and oil-cool power plant pumps out the horsepower for the 430-pound bike. 17-inch wheels, front and rear, a six-speed transmission, and a race-developed chassis are just some of the components responsible for the Katana's impressive track performance. At the drop of the green, it was Denton, Texas native Doug Poland, number 23, who took the lead. Poland is the premier production racer in the U.S. The 28-year-old rider has collected more Suzuki National Cup contingency money than any other rider since the series' inception back in 1986. Poland's weekend did not start out on a positive note, however. Practicing for the 600 race, Poland crashed hard. His tattered leathers were vivid evidence to his fall. They were adorned with souvenirs of his mishap, road rash, and that famous red Georgia clay. His Suzuki Katana motorcycle also displayed battle scars, but was quickly put back into ship shape by his crack Yoshimura crew. Back to the action and lap two of the 12 lap affair. It was on this lap that race favorite Doug Poland dropped out of the competition with mechanical problems. After all that adversity in practice, Poland's courageous effort in the 600 final went out the window due to a front brake failure. At least he went out on two wheels. That's more than I can say for these two guys who dumped their katanas big time. Neither rider was seriously hurt and corner workers were on the scene in a very quick and professional manner. With Poland out of the picture, the lead was being contested by three riders. Number four, Dave Sadowski from New England, hometown rider Paul Bray, number 11, and Louisiana's Jamie James, number 58. Lap after lap, these three substantiated the Suzuki Cup founding father's premise that equal machinery breeds tight competitive racing. At the halfway point, it became obvious that Sadowski was hooked up. The veteran rider began to slowly ease away from Bray and James, little by little, lap after lap. Enter number 280, Britt Turkington, who cut his way through the pack in impressive style. The Texan put himself right in the midst of the battle for second with Bray and James. As the laps wore down, it became clear that only a major mistake on the part of Sadowski would prevent the New Englander from taking the checkers and the $5,000 of Suzuki prize money. The battle for second was also being settled as the laps wore down. Bray had dropped off the pace, leaving James, number 58, and Turkington, number 280, to duke it out for runner-up honors. In the end, Sadowski took a well-deserved checkered flag, while Turkington nipped James for second. The top five finishers looked like this. Sadowski first, Turkington second, James third, Paul Bray held on to fourth, and Georgia's Scott Russell rounded out the top five. Here's how the top five divided up the Suzuki payout. Sadowski netted five grand, Turkington 3,000, Jamie James 2,000, and Bray and Russell 1,500 and 1,250 respectively. A total of $20,000 went out from first to 20th. Sadowski was a very happy man after taking the checkered flag. He had come so close the previous two years, but this win marked his first ever victory in the Suzuki National Cup Series finale. Sadowski was in such a good mood on the cool-off lap that he offered a stricken Doug Poland a ride back to the pits. It may not have been comfortable, but it sure beats walking. In the winner's circle, Sadowski talked about his early race battle with longtime rival Jamie James and his elation after finally winning one of the big ones. It was fun for a while. Jamie James and I have been hitting each other all year up at Loudon and such. It sort of brought back some memories, but this time I got away with the hits. So. Uh, it was a lot of fun out there. These 600s are just a ball to ride. You just hold them wide open all the way around the track and shift it. But uh, I'm, I'm really glad I finally won a GSXR event. 
Next up, a look at how the 1100cc final panned out. These are the big boys. The Suzuki GSX-R 1100 weighs just a few pounds more than the 600 Katana, yet has 450 more cc's of Suzuki muscle. 18-inch wheels, front and rear, and a 5-speed transmission are standard. Also standard is the power and handling that has made this motorcycle the choice among big bore road racers. Like the 600 race, the 1100cc contest would be a 12-lap affair. And like the 600 event, the 1100 final saw number 23 Doug Poland jump into the lead as the field funneled into turn one. That advantage was short-lived, though, as Atlanta resident Mike Hearth, number 88, took over before the completion of the first go-around. Hearth is a veteran rider who knows road Atlanta like the back of his hand. Poland was not about to let Hearth have his way, though. With yet another five grand to go to the winner, Poland set up camp on Hart's rear wheel. Meanwhile, another Atlanta resident and potential race winner was taking himself out of the picture. Paul Bray decided to test his motocross skills on lap two. Later, the young lion would claim he was nudged off the track. Whoever was to blame, Bray paid the consequences. The Hart poland battle continued during the second lap until the lead duel hit the back straight. Entering turn nine, Poland drafted Hart, snuck inside, and powered by. That move was to be the race-winning pass. Poland would never relinquish the lead. As the race progressed, Poland began to inch further and further from Hart. Back in third, number 22, Scott Russell, yet another Georgia rider, and Louisiana's Jamie James, number 58, were engaged in handlebar-to-handlebar -handlebar warfare. Back up front, Poland was riding his usual race, smooth and precise, rarely out of control. It appeared as if Doug Poland wasn't even trying, although the stopwatch indicated otherwise. Poland has come a long way since his recommitment to racing in 1986, which coincided with the inaugural year of the Suzuki Cup Series. Both he and the Suzuki Series have enjoyed mutual growth and success. Still, Poland has not let grass grow underneath him. Although he's close to realizing his potential on the track, he's come to recognize the importance of the peripheral aspects of racing that keep a rider in the sport for a long time, or at least long enough to make a lucrative living. Poland outlines the two most important lessons learned during his meteoric rise to prominence. The combination of two things is uh, uh, riding on better equipment and also uh, trying to work with uh, doing a little bit more public relations and working with sponsors a little bit more to, to uh, kind of help promote myself, which will then, you know, in turn promote the sport. You know, because my name is related with the sport, so the sport will go right along with it if I can promote myself also. So I think that's one of the bigger things I've learned since 86 and 87. Learning to win important money races is another thing Poland has learned very well. As I stated before, Poland has won more of these National Cup races and taken home more Suzuki money than anyone in the series history. Meanwhile, behind Poland, some of the new generation riders were making it difficult for veteran Mike Hart. Number 22, Scott Russell, and 58, Jamie James, caught up to Hart, and the trio were in a dogfight for the two remaining winner's circle positions, not to mention a better payday. Second was worth three grand, third two grand, and fourth 1,500, so any wrong move would be costly in earnings as well as reputation. When it came down to the final lap, Poland breezed by to take the checkered flag, while behind him, Jamie James edged Hart for second. Scott Russell finished a disappointed fourth. Poland had successfully defended his 1100cc Suzuki National Cup crown. While Jamie James made yet another winner's circle appearance, Hart settled for third, Scott Russell and 600cc race winner Dave Sadowski rounded out the top five. Looking at the payout for the 1100 race, Poland netted a cool five grand, which came in handy as he was off to a Hawaiian honeymoon after the race weekend. James' two appearances in the top three netted him 5,000 as well. The 600 and 1100 cc finals were history. The Suzuki money was spread out among several riders. The only real surprise was Poland's DNF in the 600 race. The prestigious 750 cc Suzuki National Cup final will be coming up next as the best of American motorcycle racing continues on ESPN. This class, more than any other, earns a rider's stature among his peers and in the eyes of the factory representatives and the team managers. The 750cc category is universal and one that Superbike Championships, both in the States and worldwide, base their racing formula. 
The Suzuki GSX-R750 is credited with starting the current sport bike wars among the various manufacturers. The GSX-R750 and the Suzuki National Cup Series introduced thousands to a level of sport riding and grassroots racing thought otherwise unattainable unless you had a factory contract or you were a lottery winner. The biggest field of the day, 40 riders took the green for the final dash for cash of the day. Doug Folan was the defending champion in this class. Unfortunately, he was set back in the second wave of machines. His predicament, the result of a qualifying mishap. Meanwhile, Scott Gray, who gave us that personal tour of Road Atlanta earlier, crashed out of the race on lap two. Watch at the bottom of the screen as the bike then Gray goes sliding past our camera position in turn one. Gray was up right away, but the damage had been done. The talented California rider's day was over. The only thing left was the long walk back to the pits. With Gray out of the race and Poland working his way back through the pack, number 22 Scott Russell took over the point. He had been among the leaders in the other money races, but he had yet to make the winner's circle appearance. Dave Sadowski, the New England rider now living in Georgia, had tasted the champagne in winner's circle and thirsted for more. He was lying in second, unchallenged from behind, but not making any inroads on Russell's lead. Then, before anything had a chance to get settled, Georgia's Cam Roos was involved in this horrific accident, entering the very fast turn 12. In slow motion, you can see the back end of the motorcycle already beyond the recovery point. Bruce is high-sided over the top of the machine and hits the pavement hard. Both he and the bike then careen into the hay bales. Fortunately for Roos, the 430-pound machine didn't ricochet back on top of him. Roos suffered no serious injuries after being checked out later that afternoon at a local hospital. The Roos accident prompted a red flag and a race stoppage. Track officials wanted to take all the time necessary while tending to Roos and repairing the damage done to the hay bales and the tire wall. Sanctioning body officials from the Western Eastern Road Racers Association and the medical staff on hand performed in a professional manner as they had all weekend. As I mentioned, WERA hosts this year's final. During the racing season, they are one of the clubs that stage regional races to qualify for the Suzuki National Cup Finals. Let's take a few moments and acknowledge all the racing clubs that make up the Suzuki National Cup Racing Network. The Western Eastern Road Racers Association, serving the Southeast and Mid-Atlantic region. The Mountain Road Racing Association, working out of the Boulder, Colorado area. The Oregon Motorcycle Road Racing Association, out of Portland, Oregon. The Washington Motorcycle Road Racing Association, serving the Seattle, Washington area. On the West Coast, you have the American Federation of Motorcyclists North and the American Federation of Motorcyclists South. Both serve the hotbed of racing in California and neighboring states. And finally, the American Motorcyclist Association Championship Cup Series, which is based in North Carolina and sanctions races all over the U.S. When the best of American motorcycle racing continues on ESPN, we'll conclude our coverage of the Suzuki National Cup Finals with the restart of the 750cc final. Best of American motorcycle racing is brought to you in part by Suzuki. No matter what your riding style, Suzuki has got the ride you've been waiting for. Welcome back to Road Atlanta. I'm Bruce Flanders, and you're looking at Doug Poland, sitting way back on the second to the last row of the grid. On this restart, Poland will again have to risk it all in an attempt to get up to the lead prey. The first wave is on. The second wave is about to go up. Poland revs his engine, and away he goes, threading his way through the pack. It was going to be a monumental task for Poland just to get into the top 15. Most eyes were focused on Poland's dramatic charge. Others were watching Road Atlanta ace Mike Hart assume the point, ahead of number 22 Scott Russell and number 4 Dave Sadowski. By lap 3 of 12, Russell had moved by Hart, while Sadowski was desperate to get by the number 88 machine as well. Lap 4 saw Sadowski's wish come true, as he and leader Russell began to pull away from Hart and the rest of the field. It was appropriate that Russell and Sadowski should decide the outcome of the 750 final since they were in a similar posture prior to the stoppage of the race. After several meetings, track officials decided to run the entire 12-lap distance on the restart, so Russell and Sadowski would actually battle for several laps more than the record book would eventually indicate. 
These two riders represent the old and new guard of production racing. Although only 25 years old, Sadowski has been around for several years and has several more good years ahead of him. Russell, on the other hand, is very young in the sport and has shown signs of brilliance. Many feel the Georgia-based rider could be this country's future superbike champion. Prior to the race, the slow-talking, fast-riding Southerner talked about what it would mean to win here at the finals. It would mean a lot to me because I've been laid up for the last four weeks with a broken kneecap and I didn't even think I was going to be able to ride and uh, it's really come along in the last two weeks and uh, I can ride and uh, for me to take one checkered flag, I'd, you know, I'd be the happiest thing on, on the earth, I think, at the time. While Scott Russell and Dave Sadowski played out their 100 mile an hour chess game for the lead, Doug Poland was charging like a man possessed. Maybe he wasn't going to catch the leaders, but he was going to make sure everyone would ask the question afterwards, what if Doug Poland had started with the race favorites in the first wave? Poland's throw caution to the wind riding eventually netted him an amazing eighth place. Not bad for starting on the second to the last row of a 40 rider field and having only 12 laps or approximately 20 minutes to catch up. Up front, Russell began to sense a closing Sadowski as the final lap began. Any mistake by Russell, and Sadowski would pounce. Any miscalculation in braking, any vagueness in shifting, any hesitation getting by a back marker could open the door for Sadowski. As the two headed towards the Nissan Bridge, traffic was up ahead. Sadowski closed, hoping the slower bike would somehow take away Russell's racing line. Russell did not waver. As they headed down the hill, Sadowski's rear twitches wildly. He was definitely on the edge. Russell had the momentum. It was his race. Although he too got a little squirrely as he took the coveted checkered flag. This was Suzuki Cup racing at its best. Third place went to Cal Rayburn III, who put in a smooth and mature ride. The only performance that was better than Russell's race win was Russell's cool-off celebration. It was obvious that this young rider was thrilled to take home the 750 crown. His feelings were well-founded. His win on that fall afternoon in Georgia helped land him a pro factory ride with the powerful Yoshimura team for the 1989 Superbike season. Not bad for a kid with only two full years of racing under his belt. In the winner's circle, he spoke to Moto World's Dennis Torres about holding off a determined Dave Sadowski despite a painful leg. I was hurting a little bit and got tired, and he took advantage of it, and he passed me coming down the back straight on the last lap. I kind of shut the door on him in the dip, held him off somehow or another. Well, what are you going to do with all that Suzuki money? I need to put it in the bank, I think, and try to live off of it for the next three months. Congratulations. Thank you, Dennis. A look at the final results show Russell, Sadowski, and Cal Rayburn taking the top three honors. Jamie James capped off a good day by missing his third winner's circle appearance by just one place. And Wisconsin's Scott Zampak finished in the fifth spot. The payouts for the 750 final were the same as in the other races. 5,000, 3,000, and 2,000 to the top three. Fourth place finisher Jamie James was the big winner of the day. His combined finishes in all three races earned him $6,500. Scott Russell is definitely a rider on the way up, in the same mold as Doug Poland before him. Add Dave Sadowski, Jamie James, Cal Rayburn, Mike Hart, 